Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today is meant to be a roundup, uh, just kind of uh, bringing up some questions about the year and some topics that folks have uh, challenges they may still be experiencing. And this is meant to be uh, an open format. So this is not a webinar in one way, shape or form. This is more of what can you take away from today? And so I have some few uh, general questions and I have invited a few folks specifically to kind of share their insights today. But uh, I, I open it up, everyone, please, you have the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, and if you don't have that within your phone, you know, maybe you can tap something in the chat or just listen along. But uh, today is meant to be for you and for us to kind of really share some successes from 2021, look at what 2022 has in store for us, uh, but also, you know, what are some of those unanswered or uh, wh what are some of the things that we are researching right now? I know a few of you uh, on this call has had some questions and I've sent some things across and some people have shared things with me as well. And so it's uh, an opportunity now to find common challenges and share common solutions. Uh, two of the folks here that I have invited specifically, I... I'm going to allow them to kind of kick it off and introduce themselves. Um, I, I have Brendan Letter and Brent Katz. Uh, Brendan's here in the East Coast in Pennsylvania with myself. Uh, he's a little further east than me. but uh, And then Brent is out in Minneapolis uh, where I went to grad school. Well, close to where I went to grad school. I went to Mankato, but uh, that's close enough comparatively to that 21 hour drive in between. <laughs> so I'm going to first say, uh, can you introduce yourself? But uh, Brendan, you know, share some of your highlights from this year. You know, what, what would you like to say is these are our achievements, whether it be your team, your organization, or your community. Sure. Uh, thank you, BK, for having me um, again to talk. I'm Brandon with uh, Berks County Parks Department in the eastern part of PA, like um, BK had mentioned. Um, we're sort of a moderate sized county uh, government with the parks here. Um, we got like eight, just over 860 like square miles we take care of. Parks Department's um, sort of uh, on the smaller side for a county size. Um, uh, uh, venue. Some of our local municipalities and townships and boroughs can have some stuff larger than uh, than what we, we take care of. But um, so some of the one of the uh, some of the things that are benefits are not benefits, but uh, positive things is um, I really enjoyed how our team was able to sort of um, work with the challenges of some of the COVID stuff. And I know we've all been talking COVID over the last number of years um, here. And uh, in these two seasons, um, we're really starting to see how we can do more with less. And I mean, anything from people to uh, budget um, with the increase in the visitation, um, but just the ability to overcome some of those challenges to still give our resources back to the community and give them a good product. Thank you. Yeah. Brent, you know, same question to you. you know, what, what are some of the achievements that you would like to, you know, really spot out there for your organization, your community, your team? Yeah, so for us, um, you know, it's hard not to talk about COVID, but that was the main thing that really drove how we changed or developed, adapted, in the last year and through that, you know, there was a time when our, a lot of our rec centers were closed. We have over 50 rec centers here in Minneapolis. And so um, having a lot of those um, buildings uh, not available for drop-in programming like we usually have, that we kind of just recently switched to like uh, uh, programmed events only. So we knew who was coming in the building all the time and that sort of thing. Um, gave us a chance to deep dive into some of our buildings um, and understand a little bit more about 
janitorial services and how we want to improve the efficiencies, um, different uh, methods for uh, taking care of those assets, um, partnering with some of our uh, vendors who provide the chemicals uh, that we use to clean our building. So looking at how we can do more of a, a better job of keeping the inventory that we, we need on hand in order to clean our buildings. Um, you know, I think, you know, through this, we've had so many different uh, curveballs thrown at us, you know, for a while, we also have uh, 60 some waiting pools too uh, throughout Minneapolis. And so the chlorine shortage was a big scare for us. I'm not sure if anyone else is experiencing that. And we're talking about that running into um, 2022 as well. So we're trying to keep a close eye on, on chlorine. And so we've Experience. I mean, I'm just going to blabble on you for a little bit, but, you know, looking at UV, uh, liquid chlorine, puck chlorine, um, different ways to clean things, um, maintain things. Um, we also uh, experienced a, a shortage or a, a potential shortage in field paint from our vendors too. So athletic field paint, we we're saying, um, was uh, an issue for us to get to. And so just, you know, really being able to take a look at our, day-to-day -day operations and what do we really need and how much storage do we have and how fast can we get it and what other people can we partner with in order to get supplies and that sort of stuff. Um, but just, you know, overall gave us an opportunity to kind of, even though we had so much stuff going on, the operations itself tended to slow down a little bit because we didn't have as many people in our buildings using our facilities. So we took the opportunity to deep clean and deep dive into our day-to-day -day operations. Um, this last year, basically. And that's, I was going to go into supply chain a little bit later, but, you know, you kind of opened it up right there in a sense. Is it because of the way that you need to buy things and your processes and you don't just have the ability to run out to a Lowe's? Maybe you have to go through a state purchasing process or is it, you know, is it just this not on the shelf because it's, I'm finding a little bit of both in industries right now. Yeah, it was both because we, so we have a, yeah, we have a state contract because we order so much of it. So we get preferred pricing or, you know, you know, bulk pricing on it or whatever. And so we ordered as much as we possibly could. And then our next step was to try to go to Lowe's, but or Home Depot or wherever. Um, but they, uh, you know, they were also limiting the amount we could purchase through them too. <laughs> So, you know, we'd make a trip over there and get as much as we could. Um, and we have a little bit, uh, you know, we have a small supply to get us kicked off next year, but we were doing constant calculations in regards to how much chlorine we'd go through in a week to say, okay, you know, if we can only get so much chlorine, we're going to need to pick and choose which pools get basically open this year. Um, and so that was kind of where like some of that community engagement, you know, uh, you know, community satisfaction went into our day-to-day -day operations because um, we, we luckily we didn't have to scale back. But again, going into 2022, um, that that threat is still there of not having that. So uh, we're partnering with our vendors right now to say, help, see how much we can get. We know how much we went through last year to see if we can do the same thing. So um, it's just, you know, give us a chance to look into things and, and look at the other products that we have and see what kind of uh, changes we can make to be more efficient with ordering it and holding it. We don't have a lot of room here either. So we don't, when we order it, we use it right away. Basically, we don't have like a big storage facility where we can store materials or chemicals or product, anything like that. So we we're heavily uh, uh, rely on our vendors to get our materials when we need them. I can, I can, I can echo that as well. When, um, we've been so used to having the products available almost instantaneous for, instantaneously for us. So our on-site storage isn't really there except for short-term stuff. Uh, so when you do find the availability of the materials, 
there's a shortage, there's a shortage of storage for, for us to be able to handle that kind of material because you almost have to take advantage of it when it's available, get as much as you can to hold you as long as you can with that. And we've been finding that with some of the vendors and contractors for us, even doing some uh, contract work, is that there's been sort of an explosion with um, contractors being tied up with everything and not just the product, but their availability to come even to work on projects and do some stuff for us as well, too. About other folks, I, I see Karen just popped in. We'll, we'll we'll let her catch up on the question. But you know, Brian, Ben, Karen, Judy, Barry, you know, what what are some of the supply chain kind of issues you may find in your operations or you foresee in your operations? And what are some of the solutions or have you been investigating? I guess. Well, I, hi guys. Um, I'll jump in here. Um, one of the things, obviously, I think it's going to affect most of us is uh, uh, the impact of uh, John Deere being on on strike this past year. Uh, we've been told that uh, mowers and tractors and things that we might have expected uh, in time to start the uh, grounds maintenance in, in late spring, we're not going to even see until maybe uh, fall. So <laughs> we're sort of counting those into our 23 inventory at this point. Um, you know, we were uh, 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 investing, uh, hoping to invest in some solar uh, uh, equipment this year. Again, there's some backlog there, and we're gonna we're trying to um, uh, experiment with some uh, electric vehicles with the Ford Lightning. Um, apparently, they cut off their uh, reservations at 200,000 orders. You had to put a hundred dollar deposit down, and and we were you know 200,000 plus. So uh, we're just gonna look at you know, see what Chevy's got or other other folks. But uh, so those are just some of the handful of things that we've experienced here. Hi, Ben. Hey, Karen. Good to see you. You too. I think, um, you know, because we're not a typical parks department, we're a regional park system and we don't handle a lot of the day-to-day -day maintenance. We do that with contractors. Um, but our capital repair um, projects are, are really creeping up in dollar amount. You know, the price of steel, um, the backlog, the time it takes from fabrication, just the raw materials. We've seen the, the price of concrete um, like triple in the last several months. So um, that's, we're running into some of those issues with, you know, construction takes a long time. You put together construction estimates and you get out, by the time you get to bid, all of a sudden your construction estimates don't mean anything anymore. And um, and so we're, we've had to um, value engineer projects, break them into two separate projects over different fiscal years. Um, that's just, uh, um, that's just, I think what we're gonna deal with for a long time. And we're looking at the inflation is skyrocketing. So I don't think this is gonna change anytime soon. And one thing I will say is revenues have been up. We're a sales tax funded agency and we've really bounced back um, from where we were um, in 20, we're really comparing 2019. 2020 is kind of an anomaly, but we're up over 2019. So that's kind of nice to see. Yeah, I would uh, keep with the uh, the same thought of Karen and Ben with um, the backlog of just maintenance equipment. Um, we've had a mower or two go down just to get a part or two. It takes about three months to get. I mean, it's, we got to work around that shift equipment around um, and then kind of redo uh, job descriptions and put some guys on different things and move them around to different spots and hope to get some new training. Maybe they can do more carpentry than pruning. Um, so yeah, we've kind of had to juggle both of our uh, equipment and our staff and figure out how to go with that. And then on the other end of it, getting seasonal employment um, to actually stay more than a couple of weeks uh, or even some entry level positions. That's uh, an ongoing kind of nuisance right now for us. Um, we're lucky to keep some people more than more than a day or two at times, um, but we'll see how that goes. We're, we're almost back to full capacity in staffing, so. You have to lay many off at, for, at a point in time there or? No, we, we didn't really lay anyone off. Um, yeah, we just couldn't get the, uh, where we are in the Leah Valley, um, Eastern PA, 
you can go work at a warehouse for 10 or $12 more than our entry level position right now. Um, even Sheeps or Wendy's is paying. So there's, especially over the summer, there were signing bonuses of 250 to $500 just to come in and, and start working at some of these places. Uh, we just, we, we don't have it. So now we're trying to figure out ways, um, reach out to some technical colleges or Votex and see if a uh, 18 year old would want to come work for the county for a little bit. Um, they benefits, great, great future. Even if it's three years and we start a pipeline where we can kind of build up that entry level position, that's our biggest challenge right now. How are you going about kind of sculpting out what that looks like? Like, have you broken down skill sets that are essential to a role or like, how are you creating that? Or is it just kind of? Well, we just had our staff meeting today and it, that was one of the topics, but um, if we almost see with our entry level position, we get a lot of, especially this time of the year, we get a lot of, uh, self-made entrepreneurs that don't make it in the real world that are landscape companies and they're doing their own thing and uh well winter comes around so what are they going to do so they come in and i had guys that have been working here for 20 some years and you kind of got to put your time in you got to start with a shovel or a rake but they want to jump on equipment right away and so we're trying that like that's a balance of how do we get those people in? What kind of skill sets do we have? What can we let them go do right away? But also they need to kind of work their way up and um, have the familiar, familiarity and uh, responsibility of the equipment we have and the staff above them. What other folks, you know, I have on here, one of my topics of discussion is workforce development. What, what are some of the plans that you folks have or, you know, specifically, I'm looking at legacy planning and what what is the plan for the folks that are retiring, outgoing, um, or that knowledge transfer? You know, do you have a system where it's all captured? It's somewhere in a, a format that you just literally have checklists you follow, or is it once Steve and Karen go down the road? there goes all that knowledge because they didn't write anything down. Um, well, first of all, when is this video going to be released? For, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say this because our, our board is going to adopt our budget on uh, Friday. So there's some information that's, uh, that hasn't been yet released to staff and, until tomorrow morning. Um, okay. <laughs> well, we need to share too much, uh, but I will share that uh, as part of the, uh, succession planning that we've done here uh, at Five Rivers. Um, the uh, again, as what Brian mentioned in terms of seasonals and not being able to to re, you know either not only retain them but find them uh, to to come in. Um, uh, part time staff again, it's been a challenge to to keep them um, in in the market the way it is. Uh, I'm calling it you know with a great resignation. Um, what we're trying to do, and, and two of my directors have, have done a great job of, of uh, preparing and work, working through re department reorganizations. And so looking from within, again, we're a special park district, so um, we're, we're not subject to ebbs and flows in some, some way. Uh, there, there we you know, retained a complete uh, whole workforce through the pandemic. We, we you know, made up things like our own pandemic leave uh, for staff. Um, in order to keep uh, folks whole. Um, but to that end, we, uh, part of this reorg is to take the pieces and parts that we have in, in the part-time and seasonal and to reduce those and to create some additional full-time positions uh, that will be unveiled. Uh, now it's been a little bit painful because we've had some vacancies this past year that we've purposely let vacant because <laughs> we didn't want to have incumbents in them. Um, so staff's gonna gonna hear about all this tomorrow morning. Uh, some of the details. Um, we've also created a, a new uh, uh, union uh, position for uh, between a, a regular park or a horticulture or con conservation technician or three disciplines, um, a, a next level uh, of a lead type position in between that and a site leader. Again, for that succession planning training. Uh, providing a little bit more uh, responsibility to the position to help uh, across the district. So um, 
uh, you know, we're just trying to re-energize that way. And the regional managers have all been uh, part of that uh, conversation. And so it's really been developed within their uh, brain power. And so I, th I think uh, from that perspective, it's not top down. It's, it's really, uh, you know, the, the group itself have, has developed this plan. Uh, and, and we just can't wait <laughs> till Friday afternoon to, to unveil. It's going to be, you know, a definite Merry Christmas. So that's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, but again, we're in a very, uh, uh, as I've mentioned on other calls, very blessed to, to be in this type of position that we can we can just do that <laughs> because it's our it's our system. Right. And um, in reference to what um, Karen was just saying, um, I think in the successional planning, like in the county system where we're at, it's easier to do that in our um, uh, administrative team because we can have that training. We do have our, uh, whether it's an environmental educator or one of our maintenance supervisors or our museum coordinators, uh, we can build that into their training. But our actual workforce is unionized. Um, and so even trying to get, like Karen was mentioning, even just another rank or another position, something for them to aspire to. Now I can move into, uh, you know, a maintainer two position as an example uh, to do that. Uh, is difficult in that union in that union piece. So that particular boots on the ground piece for us is difficult. Even trying to make um, salary increases because they're going off of a multi-year contract, you can't just simply go in and say we're going to help increase your uh, uh, your take home. Uh, it has to go through all those negotiations. So in that particular piece, it's, piece, it's very difficult uh, to help sweeten the deal to bring in more qualified people. Um, and I agree 100%. The new people, they just want to jump on that machine and go in. They don't want to do all the other stuff that all the other people are doing. They, well, I mowed outside and I can run a zero turn. I'm going to come in and go right on that machine. So it is a little tough. Yeah, the other thing, too, um, uh, BK mentioned about, um, you know, all that information, leave, uh, you know, in the uh, tenured staff leave. Um, one of the uh, benefits of CAPRA accreditation is that, you know, writing down operational plans and um, uh, things of that nature help uh, to provide that continuity of information. So um, you don't have to go for CAPRA, but you can certainly follow the standards in order to, uh, to build that into your system. Yeah, we're starting to add the... Um, a digital component to the maintenance management plans through our asset inventory system. So, you know, we, what we learned at the um, maintenance management uh, um, school, we, you know, did them in paper format and through Excel and that was in, in, in played around with that for a while and that was pretty successful. And now we're integrating that into our asset inventory. Um, so using the actual data we've got that's uh, pulling these plans together. And um, so that's a little bit of somewhat I guess legacy planning on the not losing that information and helping provide it to our maintenance partners who are the ones maintaining them and helping them plan for how they're going to allocate resources to maintain these segments that we build. Um, and right now we're looking at a lot at um, capital um, forecasting for the future. We just received a $15 million raise grant for another segment of the Brickline Greenway. Um, received another million dollar grant from NPS for another park we're developing. And and so we're looking at incurring a fair amount of costs associated with O&M into the future. And so we're starting to look at how are we able to start forecasting those. Um, so we're making good decisions moving forward. Well, and Ben, we've discussed previously, you end up using quite a bit of subcontracted work to get some of that kind of work done in things. And, you know, what, what are some of the, uh, rubrics or metrics that you use to help measure their performance and kind of monitor them so you make sure you're getting your money's worth otherwise you know or how do you do the comparison it's worth it for them to do it versus us staff it well it's easy for us because we have a staff uh, an administrative cap legislatively so um there is not a real scenario where we would hire a bunch of people to do the work versus hiring contractors to do the work. We will have to hire additional supervisory staff to oversee these contracts. Um, but um, so in that sense, it's, it, I say that's easy because we're kind of 
we only have one real option. Um, and that's unless something changes or there's some outside funding that would fund that, um, that would fund those employees, you know, that's the way we'll have to do it. Easy answer though. <laughs> <If we can. laughs> Yeah. Right, I guess on, on the other part of that question, then, you know, how are you monitoring the folks that are doing the work then? How do you, you know, if you needed to make a, uh, a task list and a role for those supervisory folks that may be those go-betweens, you know, what, what benchmarks are they using to monitor? So our intent, the long-term intent is to, is to use the maintenance management plans for our bid scopes of work. Right now we have basically, um, I would say it would be the um, expectations of, you know, what that condition of that facility should be and uh, ask them to maintain it up to, you know, what level of care that we ask. So whether it takes them once a week, twice a week or every day, um, that's kind of on them. And our contractors did say this year, we have a new contractor. This 21 was a new contractor for a three-year contract. And they said there are definitely sites that they were anticipating twice a week and they're there every day. Um, and so they are, you know, they're eating some of that and trying to make up for it elsewhere and realizing that in the winter months, um, uh, you know, their time is reduced when there's less visitors on those sites so they can sort of make it up. So, um, but, you know, our, our supervisor is responsible for being out there and looking at the level of care and ensuring that it's kept to that the level of the standard, that's the standard that it's required for that site. So, um, and it's tough because I, like we've all talked about staffing issues, our contractors have staffing issues as well. Um, they have difficulty keeping people on. And then sometimes, you know, they have a couple warm bodies for a period of time and they don't really work out because they realize they don't really want to do park work anymore and, um, and we'll go do something else. So there's a fair amount of turnover. You know, our security contractors, and we have a contract, but they came to us in the middle of last year and said, um, you know, we bid this rate, but we have to pay them more. So otherwise, they're basically saying, like, you need to pay them more. Like, we can keep them at that same rate, but the quality of people that we're able to attract and the turnover is is going to be unacceptable for the standards they would like to care. Um, and so we ended up having to give them a raise uh, mid in the mid-year of their contract and then we'll give them another raise um, starting in January. Um, he said they just their people are moving so easily for 25 cents more an hour they will split and other people are having signing bonuses and they're um, so they're really struggling to, uh, to keep people. And if can I can I ask about your security? Um, we're, we're always trying to figure out how to we don't have our, our sheriffs don't help out in our parks. Um, most of our parks are in regional areas. State police won't cover for minor types of things. How do you, you said that you have a security um, contractor? Like, so you bid it out for like a, a private uh, firm or something or? Yeah, we use a private firm. Um, right now we're under contract with uh, Garda World, which used to be Wayland um, Security, but it's Garda World Security Services now. Um, we've got one particular park in downtown St. Louis. They're there 24 seven, um, unarmed, um, officer, um, three shifts a day that they're just patrolling the park and, um, writing reports. And, and if it's anything that's a legal issue, like, you know, someone's committing a crime, they call the police. Um, okay. we, they do have second shift officers that we could hire. They're considerably more expensive about 65 an hour versus we're paying these folks. Um, I think with their administrative fees, like our, we pay about 20 some dollars an hour. I forget what it is offhand. Um, and then we've also got bike mounted patrols, again, unarmed. Um, they're on a few different segments of greenways. Um, really they're there to, uh, uh, as a presence and to report. Again, if any crimes are committed, they are um, calling the police department. Hmm. Never thought about that way. I'm always trying to figure out different ways. So I'll have to look into that. Thank you. Hey, Ben, I was going to ask a while back, you mentioned, uh, like, I think asset management software. Did, did you mention that? What, can I ask what your, what system you're using? We're using ArcGIS. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we use a web-based platform that we mostly interface with our, 
our IT contractor is, you know, in ArcGIS. We have some new folks now that are working in ArcGIS. So I mean, we're still in ArcGIS. It's just a web-based um, platform. So it's a much cheaper license. It's less complicated for people like me who I'm not a GIS <laughs> technician and <laughs> understand it all. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So that, like, when you say that, like, so that just uh, kind of maps out where things are at, or does that really, like, give you, like, life cycle information, or does that give you, like, uh, work order information? Can you do those sort of things through that, through ArcGIS? ArcGIS? Yeah, it's, it's uh, Esri is the, yeah. the platform. And so Esri, there's a lot of stuff customizable. Um, so we do a very little work order. That's just not how we operate. You know, we don't have a bunch of staff, so we don't have a work order system, but we have a way of tracking like an issue. If a broken sign, we'll make sure we log it so we, we keep it on top of mind so it doesn't just disappear in the back of your mind and never get fixed. But uh, those are capable. Um, we've got some different, uh, we've got another contractor that we worked with to put together these life cycle costs and, um, um, that they're also working on our maintenance management plan. So they're helping us forecast um, what sort of the day-to-day -day costs are for greenways. And then also based on the life cycle of our assets, um, when those will be need to be repaired. So we can sort of like kind of forecasting into the future, working with our, you know, five-year CIP. Um, and so it sort of ties in line with our capital improvement plan as with these also these, uh, when these replacement plans will take place. Um, and so it's all tied to the data. So each, so, I mean, every sign and every bench, you know, that has a life cycle. So, you know, if it's a 10 year old, obviously things get run over before 10 years, but you know, it's just helping us forecast when we can anticipate those costs and it's big things. I mean, it's the bridges, the trail surfaces. I, I don't know that we, um, while we're tracking the data down to like benches and trash cans, like, I mean, I don't, I don't have it tracked out and say in the year 2022, I'll need 50 trash cans. Like we were, it's really the bigger costs that we're trying to anticipate. Sure. Thanks. There's a program in our, um, survey one, two, three. It's probably your most generic and base level one. But uh, we use that just to kind of track some of those things as Ben was talking about, mainly benches, um, kiosks entranceways, gates, stuff like that, just to kind of get a base level data together. Um, and then you can just throw it on a tablet. Um, guys are out in the field, they can just, if it got vandalized, if they, it just go through your quarterly routine of inspections. Got it. Well, thanks guys. Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't use a work order system uh, where we are, but um, I can tell you that this past year and uh, into the early part of 22, our uh, planning and projects uh, team have been developing, uh, not unlike what Ben mentioned, this uh, agency-wide uh, repair and replacement plan to accompany our tent. We, we go on a 10-year CIP uh, cycle that we update you know, and forecast out, but um, it's, it's imperative that agencies get, get this information and document it. Um, because when things uh, happen, uh, you know, we have a foundation, uh, again, that we're very uh, fortunate to, to have support from for the, for the entire agency. Then we have two specific parks that have their own foundations and have been, have, you know, had, had those for years. Um, so, you know, we can go to the Cox Arboretum Foundation and say, hey, you know, uh, can you help us with this improvement at the Arboretum? And through their uh, fundraising and their efforts, you know, they they can support that, um, you know, pave, paver replacement project or uh, this coming year, for instance, they're going to help support the, the restaining and uh, repair of some uh, siding for our, our campus uh, out there at the Arboretum um, that, that then doesn't impact our agency uh, capital so that we can address those dollars elsewhere. Um, so if you have the data and you can say, hey, you know, we're going to replace the, the roof on our farmer's market next year. Um, we know that it's a 20 year roof and we know that, you know, <laughs> we can we can get this done and, and we won't necessarily have to replace this for the, you know, for another 20. Um, it helps uh, again with going back to your earlier question about the continuity of information. Uh, who has it? Where it is? Is it accessible to all levels of the agency? Uh, to make better informed decisions. So, I'm curious for everyone, you know, how deep down the rabbit hole do you go when you think on the 
asset management kind of mindset? And, or is that something that maybe you encourage each level of the organization to have their own part of the process? You know, like, do we go down as far as like urban forests where they're literally every single tree is mapped out on that ArcGIS and then that way you know specific columns on your spreadsheet. There's a checklist that you use for those inspections, for those ground staff to be doing that. You know, so is the system built bottom up or trying to be built with that mindset or is it still kind of we're still trying to figure out what we're measuring before we can actually go and execute it. Well, we're not, we're not uh, evaluating where every single uh, tree is, but we have some significant uh, specimens that we, we want to, to track for, for whatever reason. Um, so some of those are there, but uh, typically this is, as you know, was mentioned earlier, it's the shelters, it's the uh, grills, it's um, to the, to the roofs, um, to the HVAC systems, um, all, just a wide variety of things. But in our asset management uh, system, it can be from the sublime to the ridiculous. You know, my outdoor connections uh, department will uh, uh, scan in every single paddle, uh, you know, to, to accompany each kayak, you know, um, so they each have their own serial number where uh, on the park side of my life, you know, they'll, you know we, we don't, I don't even know if we actually record the, the chainsaws anymore. You know, we've sort of stopped at the thousand dollar threshold of, of entering data into the into the system because it's it, too much data, right. you know, uh, debilitating, so. We, we're kind of in the middle of trying to do all this stuff. We have some good work done, uh, but our asset management um, software, which we use ViewWorks, um, just didn't get implemented the right way. And so we're kind of going back, trying to get the right uh, attributes and, and get that system figured out. Um, but, you know, we have our GIS person just left us, unfortunately, for the same reasons we've been talking about, you know, a better paying job, uh, you know, bonuses, whatever it was. So we, we were really cooking with gas, we felt like, because a lot of this stuff, um, helped us immensely being mapped out via GIS. So we have uh, rec centers that partner with schools, right? And so we need delineations in regards to who's removing the snow from these certain areas or whose athletic field is it, whose playground is it, that sort of thing. And so we, we're really like trying to capture everything, uh, park benches, uh, playground equipment, uh, what's seven four HVAC roofs, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also, I also do stuff like, uh, you know, we have basically summer, spring operations and a fall, winter operations here in Minnesota, right? And so we're even GISing like where our bathrooms and our, and our BIFs are because we, some areas need to be uh, uh, maintained more than others. And so we have BIFs there during the summer and spring, but then in order to eliminate those costs, we remove those um, and only have certain ones in the winter time. And so when we, when we remove those, um, we get a lot of phone calls from our community saying, hey, where did it go? It's gone. What happened? And so then we have to kind of explain, well, we have certain operations in the spring and summer and different in the winter. And so we have, you know, we're working on trying to get two different maps based. Like here's the, here's our summer amenities and here's where they're at, you know, drinking fountains, bathrooms, biffs, whatever it is. And here's where our winter amenities are, uh, biffs, ice rinks, sledding hills, et cetera, et cetera. And so it just... It helps, uh, you know, we're just trying to GIS almost everything so we can communicate to our community where, where things are at, where the amenities are at, and where, where we may need to maintain the net too. Cause it's fairly large. People need to know where to go, I guess, if we maintain some of these things. And what's some of the communication plans with that data then? How is that data getting out there to the end users and your stakeholders? Is it one of those, um, you know, not to point at any government body here in Pennsylvania, but you know, sometimes there's great websites that are developed that no one ever goes to because it's supposed to be maintained by the users and they're not, you know, so, um, you know, like what, how, how is that being out, getting out there? Is it giant maps that are kind of interactive or is it a social media communication or what actually works? 
a little bit of all that BK, to be honest with you, there's, you know, we have, so we have a communications department um, who mainly works on uh, our, you know, works on our website communications. They work, they do, we use Twitter, we use Facebook, we use, you know, whatever means we can get to people. Uh, we also have like .gov deliveries. Uh, so it goes to a group of, of individuals that are, you know, uh, signed up to get these uh, informational emails. And so um, what we're working on is trying to use, you know, ArcGIS to have these maps are available links on our website. And so the two that we're probably most proud of um, is our, our pool, uh, waiting pool app. So it, you know, with 60 some pools, are not always all up at the same time. And we have two water parks too. So, you know, if it's a hot day here in some of our more concentrated areas, they use those pools to like basically cool down or to like get out of a hot, you know, urban setting. And so they need to know if their pool is open. So we go on there and our field staff have the ability to turn on or off those pools. And so when they go to that, um, our website to look, they'll, you know, get a, a, a red that's not open or a yellow that we're working on and it'll be open later that day or a green, like, hey, yep, we're open for operations. And the same thing will happen for our ice rinks too in our warming houses. So if for some reason there's like a COVID outbreak, or we can't open a building because of COVID, it'll be red and they can't access that building any longer. Or if there's a safety issue with say lake ice on one of our rinks on the lakes, we'll turn it red if the ice doesn't measure thick enough, that sort of thing. So um, those are the two that we're working the on the most and then again I mentioned the, the bathrooms are the best because people want to know where those are in the summertime if they're doing a run around the city training for a marathon or whatever it is they want to know where those drinking fountains are and where those bathrooms are to plan their routes most efficiently so um, we're working on trying to do more of that you can always do a google map like google google will, will almost create a map for you as long as you put the uh, uh, latitude and longitude in there they'll like it, it's just like a feature that I didn't even really know about until I you know, some of our computer people who know a lot more about that stuff than I do, but it'll just like, you just put it in there and it'll create a map for you basically. And you can add attributes into those maps. It's pretty slick. If you don't have, uh, you know, the GIS capability of people to put that information in for you. Um, so we'll use a, a combination of that and the ARC GIS stuff based on who the availability of people to do that work. Um, but the ARC GIS Esri stuff is much, much better, uh, in my opinion, than the, than the Google stuff because it's you can put you can put information in there, uh, a BIF with an enclosure, a BIF with a concrete slab on it, a BIF that you know that you can that's removable, that sort of stuff. So with Google, it's just it's just a point on a map basically. You can't really like use that for uh, any for like CIP or capital improvements or any sort of like funding down the. Uh, uh, condition ratings, can't condition rate on any of that kind of stuff. So um, a hybrid between, the two, between Google Maps and then the ArcGIS stuff, basically. I have to ask what a BIF is. Ah, uh, BIF, like a satellite toilet. Uh, a, mobile, uh, a mobile outhouse, uh, you know, uh, a satellite, that sort of thing. So it's kind of like a Xerox, I guess, here in Minnesota. Like uh, people, yeah, I got to make a Xerox, right? Well, Biff is like the company basically that supplies satellites, so everyone calls them uh, Biffs in Minnesota here. Basically, that's like Morton Buildings yeah. around here in Central Pennsylvania, yeah, or Coke <laughs> down in Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about if we think about some of the operational efficiencies? What are what are some of the biggest challenges we may be focusing on right now trying to improve in our operations and so this is very open to interpretation of what you mean by operations that could be uh, your internal structures the way the, the the trying to break down the silos a little bit or it could be um, finding new suppliers and considerations so what are some of the operational efficiencies you want to focus on in 2022? Well, I have a question. Yes. Go ahead, Karen. So I am, I've been on the fringe of park maintenance almost my entire career. So I've just been newly uh, appointed director here at Muhlenberg Township. So I'm just getting into this park maintenance thing. 
So I have a question about, um, does anybody put one of those coated kind of locks on any park doors? Um, the reason I'm asking um, is we do loan out keys to our facilities for those people that rent. And it's just becoming cumbersome having to come in to get them, getting them back from them. So somebody suggested that, you know, sort of like you have on your own home, you punch in a four digit code and, and it opens the door kind of thing. Um, is that a usable um, thing out in the public park system? What kind of building are you putting this on? It would be probably some restroom doors and concession areas that we allow our renters to use. Uh, we, we've kept it old school and have some hasps and uh, combination locks so that we don't have to have the expense of the, um, you know, electrical systems and all that. So um, for those those types of things. Okay. Some of them, like on the homeowner level, they, they do have ones that are just battery powered. So they don't even have to be hardwired or anything like that. Or you could even go as simple as like like the real estate agency does where they put the key the, the key inside a lock pad and hang it over the door. <laughs> we researched a company. They were, um, they partnered with one of the Neha Foundry. I believe they were at the um, PWX show here in um, St. Louis. And they were have these electronic locks that operate through um, an app and at that show they were talking about the uh, basically a padlock and you could have a an app on it and then you would you would just press it like you know you open up the app and press it and the lock pops open and they're all battery power but they'll last like two years the batteries in them do um, they've also got a, a whole key system where the actual key has the microchips in it and you're managing the keys so you physically have a key, but the key is all electronic and that's what's opening it. Um, it was a really cool system and, and we met with them virtually a couple times and we just really couldn't make it work for us. And it was expensive. There was a considerable cost to implementing this. And the, the big part of the cost that we were running into was the cost of um, managing the system. So there was like a license fee that you'd have to pay and um, and they actually offered to waive that initially until we sort of grew our usage to a point where we would need to start incurring that cost. Um, but it just was kind of forced at that point. But, you know, I manage our office um, door access system through OpenPath, which we all have apps on our phones. That's how you open all of our doors. Um, but it's very similar. We use a, we have a bunch of keys and a bunch of different people that access some contractors, partners. And I thought a virtual or digital system would be convenient because we can if someone leaves, you know, like everybody's got, you know, a 3285 master lock key and, and your, your agency probably has like hundreds of them and nobody knows where they all go. And as, as, as much as you want to think you do a key sign in and out, you know, you just never get them back. Um, and this way you just, through this system, you would just just uh, delete someone's account. And so they their account would no longer have access to it. And so you don't have keys that you can't get back from people. Um, but again, there is a cost to it. And so you, you sort of have to weigh on whether that's um, something you're willing to incur. And what was that system called again, Ben? Um, it's like Bloy, B-L-O-Y was the company. I think they're a Norwegian company. Now, the, like the padlock itself was like $300. Um, and so that seemed high. But now we're also dealing with areas where, where people don't want to open the locks they just or put them back on they just open them and toss the lock in the woods and we never see them again so I can replace a bunch of $60 locks pretty fast to get me to 300. Thank you for your input. Sure. The question is from other folks what are some of the burning uh the burning questions that you may have Focusing you know, operations, staffing, sustainable, you know, future plans. Are, are, is anyone, uh, does anyone have a uh, sustainability coordinator or sustainability manager on your, on your staff? 
No. We, we've had a coordinator for several years, and uh, as of two days ago, we promoted him to a manager position, and now he's uh, going to be reporting directly to me. I told him that was good news, bad news uh, uh, in his world, but, you know, um, but we as an agency, it's one of our initiatives and, and our fundamentals, so we're elevating that uh, to move forward again, as I mentioned, the electric vehicles and um, uh, you know, we're looking to, like I said, replace the roof on our, our uh, downtown farmer's market. And so I said, we, we really need to look at solar <laughs> panels to put on the top of this puppy. Um, but that, you know, it involves then looking at the envelope and everything else. So we're just looking for some, uh, be curious to know what public agencies are doing to help um, infuse this into our day-to-day -day operations. So. And where did that position kind of where did you mold that from did you have an example of you know you've seen it yeah um, well as i said he's been functioning as a we stole him he was basically an education coordinator uh with a personal interest uh, in sustainability and so uh four years ago when we did a, a agency-wide reorganization um we elevated that you know transferred that over i should say to a uh, to focus on sustainability so each of our parks and facilities um, has a green team liaison, we call them. Um, so, you know, in our, in our shops and, and whatnot, there are uh, compostable um, uh, expectations for um, food. Uh, we have a sustainable policy regarding our, our agency events and things that we produce. So we're using compostable ware and, and uh, zero waste um, sort of focus for, for what we can control, not for outside agencies coming in, but we've uh, parlayed a lot of our county uh, uh, recycling uh, grant uh, dollars. So we have a, a compostable area at the Arboretum now that we just got a, I don't know, uh, we know coming this year, we're going to get another, I think, 30 some thousand dollar grant that we, you know, basically have to pay 11 a uh, thousand additional for that we're creating a whole site out there. So we have an industrial grinder and <laughs> things like this. Oh, so you have a digester and everything that you're doing uh, out there now. Wow. Yeah. So we have, you know, several horticultural parks. So we're trying to use that compost and turn that back into a uh, uh, material that we can use not only at the, at the gardens, but we have, uh, at one point we were in the Guinness book of world records, apparently for the, uh, the largest community garden. Uh, I think that's been uh, usurped at this point, but um, there's more than 300 uh, paid plots at, at one of our, our community gardens. Um, but we have a, a, a large, um, uh, diverse, uh, international um, population uh, here in Dayton. And so a lot of, uh, uh, at, at one other park, they like to go there as, as a community uh to, to farm and to, to socialize and, and to be there. So we're, we're investing back into the, the community in that way. Plus we send our staff out uh, to, to uh, help, <laughs> honestly, we drag the, the uh, tiller around and, and do a lot of the local neighborhood uh, community gardens as well uh, that we helped pilot and whatnot. So they, they don't have the ability to, to, to do those, uh, the prep work in the spring. So, so yeah, we're, we're all about, um, trying to be out in the community with this stuff. So it is That's definitely great. an investment. So anyway, great examples. how did I develop the manager thing? I stole stuff uh, online that I could find from, uh, for instance, uh, um, Toledo, uh, Columbus, uh, uh, Metro Parks. Um, uh, their, their, their sustainability manager is, is tied in with their zoo. <laughs> so I so, said, well, we're not gonna have a zoo here. Uh, that we do have two farm parks, but um, so some of the language uh, was relevant. Uh, so, and then of course the city of Dayton has a sustainability manager on their staff as well. So we were able to, to use some of that local language, so. That's great. And he, so you have somebody to focus on those kind of initiatives specifically. Right. And is that pulling on to, you know, other industries outside of parks and recreation then are they kind of diving into uh, land preservation and those kind of audiences or where, where are you seeing overlaps that are being good synergies well we've uh, like i said i've, I've served on a, a local um it's called the dayton regional green 
uh, council, so on an executive council. Uh, so as a, as a community <laughs> working with our county, um, there's a lot of incentive grants um, uh, for these uh, types of programs, both at the school uh, with our local churches. So we have a lot of different um, uh, businesses. Uh, we have, uh, 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 I'm trying to think what their name is, Kibi. Uh, engineering, you know, so they they came in and did an audit, for instance, a few years ago, we, we paid them to do it, but uh, audited all of our HVAC and uh, systems so that we could, again, go into the long-term asset management plan to say, hey, you know, we need to be able to replace some of these hot water uh, heaters with on-demand, you know, and so we knew, okay, well, we can't just do this, you know, globally or, you know, all at once, so as, as we phase them out, you know, we, we have that plan and we have that audit to help uh, guide it. So folks from HEPI are, you know, are on this committee that I serve with. Um, so it's, it's monthly, you know, uh, we'll have, or I'm sorry, now it's quarterly, it used to be monthly uh, meetings um, really to look at the community at large. So again, it's a wide swath of, of folks. Great. You, you brought up some good points there and maybe some other folks have examples. They may be implementing, you know, energy consumption. I've been seeing huge influx of swapping over from incandescent lighting and high pressure sodium going over to LEDs. Um, and then large savings are starting to use that justification for upgrades and systems and things. Automation, you know, just the fact that lights turn off when no one's in a room. Uh, those kind of small opportunities. What are some folks doing right now? Yeah, you know, we're sweet, we're trying to switch over to LEDs in as many buildings and athletic fields as possible for you know a couple of reasons. One, the energy savings, and then two, the they last a lot longer too, and so that's part of our deal. And then uh, trying to, um, I'm not directly coordinated with this the effort, but um, uh, doing, I forget the program, I'm sure somebody knows about it, where you measure all your electricity that you use and what what's that, uh, B3 or something, or that's a system we use to measure, I think it was B3 or something, but we have people trying to measure, you know, how much energy and what, what buildings are most efficient, you know, taking a look at our utility bills um, and entering that into the information um, and uh, we had, I think we had, uh, who was it? Maybe Excel, who is our energy provider here in Minnesota, um, come out and do an audit of our buildings. So they'd walk through and do an audit. And then uh, basically they would just come out and do the work too. Um, and it would all be paid for through grants. Uh, we wouldn't really have to put much money towards it at all, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, and then, our board is con we're governed by a separate board other than our city so they're constantly asking when we purchase it's great and it's also annoying at the same time <laughs> but what type of vehicles are we purchasing uh you know is it efficiency can we purchase electric trucks and uh, all that kind of stuff so it's, it's interesting one of the things too bk with us is that we have an interest with the people coming to the park to have um electric vehicle stations, charging stations for their vehicles, not just for anything that we may have, but they want to have that in parks. Uh, and that's one of the things we don't have. And that's one of the things we're looking for in the future, because it is a need, it's an upcoming need, and it will be, it'll be here sooner than we think. So we look at that when we're trying to upgrade our infrastructure uh, as well, to offer that to the people. We just, here in Muhlenberg, we just put a charging station in our parking lot next to our township building. And it was actually exciting today because we saw charge, uh, car charging which that's the first one I saw. So, um, and we did get a grant for that. Um, may not have covered all the costs, but uh, I would say the large majority of the cost was covered by a grant. Yeah, and those are some great examples of how our park systems can become more infrastructure in our communities. You know, and that's kind of one of the, my goals for the Institute next year is to really emphasize how there's a lot of opportunities to change the mindset of parks being amenities that we're taking care of and being community infrastructure that we're stewards of. It's a matter of thinking it's community investment and it is things that the, uh, we we are the ones making sure that it's 
being cared for and not just being thrown away. Um, I notice we're running out of time and people are dropping out, uh, but it is, it's meant to be fun today. And so as we end here, I, I was looking for a little bit more festive backgrounds. You know, so I kind of <laughs> went with the green to start, but uh, you know, I, I figured maybe we could think of some of our favorite uh, holiday movies. And so I, I, I started here um you know because you know of course you could and there's the fifth one coming out soon um but you know, i didn't know if everyone would get this so you know i, I figured i could go with that i did have uh well you can't really see it there we go there so now i got my diehard scene uh the, the this one this one just didn't work out and especially depending on where I was sitting. Uh, so I figured um, I'd, I'd go with this. And so <laughs> you, you uh, I want to thank yes, everyone. People love your backgrounds, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one, it even got, you know, so the, the lamps there too. So, <laughs> but uh, I want to thank everyone for participating today. Is there anything uh, folks would like to say in closing today? Happy holidays to you all. Yeah, thanks for the information again. Thank you. Yes. So I uh, thank everyone for participating uh, and we look forward to seeing you in 2022. So take care and stay healthy, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.